Well, hey, Julie. Hey, Eric. You know, ever since we dropped our last episode about LGBT people and the Methodist Church, I felt a little bit like I've had this proverbial target on my back, you know? I do. (laughs) I've been stopped in hallways by random people who were viscerally angry about it. I've gotten some weird and threatening phone calls and Facebook messages about it. And some people were just really triggered by it. People on both sides of the aisle, by the way. Yeah, it's been an interesting few weeks around here for sure. Yes. And what's been most interesting to me is just how the people who seem to be the most upset about the episode also were some of the ones who clearly had not really listened to it. There was one woman who approached me and she was trembling with anger and she was in tears. And she said, I just can't believe you, Eric Huffman. And so I tried to just uh, diffuse the situation and I said, okay, just tell me what you heard that upset you so much. And she responded, you want to kick the gay people out of the church? And obviously we never said that and I don't believe that at all. On the contrary, actually, but whenever I asked more questions, she admitted that she hadn't really listened to the episode herself. She just heard other people talking about it. And there was another guy who said something that indicated he didn't really understand the episode either. He said, you featured a gay celibate man in David Bennett, but you didn't feature a married gay person. And I was like, well, Bishop Olivito talked about her wife, you know, and and so she was clearly in the spotlight. But all this to say, we've come to this conclusion over the last couple of weeks that Whenever people, ourselves included, whenever we have our minds already made up about something and our heels are are dug in about it, we're going to interpret whatever we experience and whatever we hear through that filter of our preconceived notions. And so whenever we take that interpretation of what we experienced or heard to our echo chambers, whether they're a liberal echo chamber or conservative echo chamber, that narrative will then take on a life all its own. So if somebody says something that doesn't fit into our preconceived ideology, that person is going to be bad and entirely wrong. Yeah, I think what's happening is it's easier to label someone a bigot or a heretic than it is to really listen. Mm. And when we really listen to other people, to their stories, we're challenged to revisit our own assumptions and agendas. You know, when I listened to David Bennett's story for the first time, my story began to change. And it's uncomfortable, but it can also be so powerful. Totally. Absolutely. The coolest thing for me has been hearing from listeners who go to more conservative churches and even a few pastors saying that the episode changed everything for them. They're changing the way they welcome gay people in their churches. Mm. They felt compelled to be more loving and open. And one pastor of a really large church told us that after he listened to that episode, he immediately reached out to a gay member of his church to invite him to coffee just to hear his story. That's awesome. But- Eric, I know those negative reviews must speak way louder in your mind than the positive ones. And I want to tell you before you give those voices too much power that I'm proud of you. And even though, you know, you didn't make the popular choice, you made a brave one. And even if I don't agree with everything you said, I respect you more than ever because of how you said it. Oh, thank you, Julie. Julie Miraculous. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm proud of you, too. And I think it's true for all of us that um, anytime we step out and take a risk, the negative feedback is always going to be easier to internalize than positive feedback is. I've always felt like that's true. Um, But it was really confirmed for me last week whenever we sat down with today's guest. He told us that the human brain is actually designed to process and store negative experiences more efficiently than positive ones. And whenever that happens, shame can take over. And shame is this dark and sinister force in the universe that really has the power to impact all of us. Yeah, Dr. Kurt Thompson began studying shame before Brene Brown took the conversation mainstream a few years ago. And he's about to tell us what shame is, what exactly is happening in our brain chemistry when shame takes hold, and how we can all reprogram our brains to unroot that shame. Yeah, and my favorite part about Dr. Thompson's research and his approach is how Everything he's learned about shame in the human brain leads back to my two most favorite concepts, God and stories. I'm indifferent I'm to God. the existence. God is not judging them. I don't have proof. I don't know how to pray. They're judging themselves. You know, where is God in all of this? This is my home. God exists. What does it say about God that he created the orgasm? I don't pledge allegiance to anything. I don't pray. Only to God. If there was a God. And I thought. I just have this understanding that life is hard. He could never love me after this. God is still good. You're listening to Maybe God. I'm Eric Huffman.
a few weeks ago, a friend was telling me a, a story about how God has been changing his life in some really, really powerful ways. And he kept bringing up this book he's reading called The Soul of Shame by Dr. Kurt Thompson. And then he told me that Dr. Thompson was going to be in Houston to speak at Rice University's Veritas Forum. So I started looking into this guy, and he's really impressive. He's a psychiatrist and an expert in the field of interpersonal neurobiology. His books are highly regarded, and he's leading this successful private practice outside of Washington, D.C. He's doing some phenomenal work. But in all honesty, um, despite his impressive credentials, I still wasn't convinced that I should be excited to speak with him. Why? Because over the past decade, Dr. Thompson has focused his work almost entirely on shame. And I have been so arrogant <laughs> when it comes to shame. Um, I'm ashamed to admit it, <laughs> but I have always equated shame with weakness. And I've always felt like the anti-shame movement that's going on in culture was some kind of new agey, self helpy product of our snowflake culture. And everyone in my world would send me that same Brene Brown TED talk over the last five years, and they all told me, you've got to watch this, Eric, you've got to watch this. When you walk up to that arena and you put your hand on the door and you think, I'm going in and I'm gonna try this, shame is the gremlin who says, uh-uh, you're not good enough. You never finished that MBA. Your wife left you. I know your dad really wasn't in Luxembourg, he was in Sing Sing. I know you, there's things that happened to you growing up. I know you don't think that you're pretty enough or smart enough or talented enough or powerful enough. I know your dad never paid attention even when you made CFO. Shame is that thing. I never watched it. But luckily, the Maybe God team talked me into doing this interview with Dr. Thompson. And it didn't take long for him to have me convinced that this is a real thing happening in our brains. And in a matter of minutes, he had me digging into my own deeply lodged shame that I was hoping to spend the rest of my life avoiding. Here we go. So, uh, Kurt Thompson, Dr. Kurt Thompson. Thank you again um, for, for your time. It's valuable, yeah. I know. and oh, It's great to be here. Uh, why don't we just start with a word of prayer? That's right. Uh, God, thank you for this beautiful, beautiful day. Thank you for Kurt. And his Dr. Day. Thompson started by sharing part of his own story and how he ended up in medical school decades ago, almost by accident. Well, I think that psychiatry found me. I don't think I found it. How his Christian family worried about his decision to pursue mental health. They were worried that I was going to enter into some field that was going to swallow me whole. Uh, and I think for no small reason, for the same reason that many Christians over a long period of time have been wary of the mental health profession, uh, not sure that you can both be in that field and maintain your faith at the same time. But how ultimately he found his life's purpose. My work is to walk with people and invite them to tell their stories more truly. And that involves telling lots of things about our stories that the neuroscience can help educate us about. After about 15 years in private practice, he discovered a common thread in all the stories he was hearing from his patients. We talk in the field of interpersonal neurobiology about what we call states of integration. And we might say that when human beings or when systems, when communities are flourishing, they've reached states of integration. And there are different components of that that are necessary to make that happen. What I was really curious about and wanting to explore was just the growing reality uh, that I became aware of in taking care of patients over 15 or 20 years, the role that shame plays in disintegrating systems. Mm -hmm. There was very little that patients would talk with me about that at some level didn't involve this phenomenon. There's a gentleman, Alan Shore. In an optimal situation with, very, with, an, with a good enough mother, this was a term. He's one of the first folks that identified that shame shows up early and often in our lives, as early as 15 to 18 months of age. Kids don't even have to be linguistically aware at all in order to sense it, experience it, feel it, and then translate it that neurobiologically. And when she skips, when she misses, she's there to repair. 
The mm -hmm. key to this is she's there to repair. In this kind of a situation, you're looking at, in an optimal situation, what's called a secure attachment. And a secure attachment is an indicator of later resilience, while an insecure attachment... What is a working definition of shame? Shame is not an abstraction. It's not this thing that happens off in the ether. It happens physically. It happens in our brain. And it happens physically and in our brain long before we're in brain time, long before we're ever aware that we're actually even having this experience. Alan Shore talks about shame being akin to driving a standard transmission automobile. If you have your accelerator and you have your brake and you have your clutch, what it is is just like newborns do and toddlers do, they're in what we would call go mode all the time. I'm just doing mm -hmm. things, just going, going, going. That's my accelerator that's moving. And in our brain, that's my sympathetic drive system that's acting. It's in sympathy with what I want. But at some point, somebody has to say, slow down or stop or no. For most kids, we, the parents, are the aversive stimulus. We say no. And when we say no, when we redirect them, when we interrupt their accelerator, when we decelerate the engine, we do so by turning on what we call their parasympathetic drive system. And this is happening all day, every day. It's happening with, for all of us, all the time. The real question is what happens in a child? What happens when they are in go mode and the engine is suddenly decelerated? Is there a clutch? Because we know what happens to a standard transmission automobile when the car slows, comes to a stop, but there's no clutch. The engine doesn't just stop, it stops violently. Shame is what happens when we are in go mode and suddenly we decelerate and there's no clutch involved and we ask, well, what is the clutch? And the clutch is an attuned interpersonal relationship. So if I'm the parent and I have to get somebody to decelerate, the real question is, to what degree can I be deeply connected to you while I'm having you slow down? Shame is what happens when there's nobody to be connected to me while you're having me decelerate. And these things can happen in all kinds of ways. We talk of all kinds of shaming experiences that people think about when there's been sexual abuse or there's been some kind of physical trauma. But they can be minor things, like you're at a party and you're part of two or three people who are having a conversation and you you offer a, something into the conversation and the conversation just keeps going with no acknowledgement. Happens to me all the time. Yeah, I, I, I understand why. <laughs> and so these things happen. And, and of course, we're not going to stop and say, excuse me, why did you people just ignore what I said? No, because that because they might say, well, because you're stupid and, 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 <laughs> and, like, and we don't want to be even more shamed. But that's not going to create a horrible thing in my life. But we have these kinds of moments all the time. Sure. And the fact that they start so young, the fact that I don't need words, the fact that all I need is the glance, the tone of voice, the body language, the turning away. And here's the thing. The vast majority of how we experience shame doesn't usually come to us from the outside. It usually comes to us from within the privacy of our own heads. I should have done this. I should have done that. I wasn't good enough for this. I wasn't good enough. And I do this just like dozens of times every day. And of course... There is, in that context, no interpersonal relationship slowing that down, connecting with me. Right. Because I'm all by myself while I am condemning myself. Yeah. One of the things that we notice uh, about neural networks um, is that those things that tend to be afflicting, affective states that are afflicting, things that I don't like, negative emotions— I can take those in and encode those very, very quickly. For shame, I can encode it in less than three seconds, mm. and it will stay with me. For me to encode the felt sense of the compliment that you pay me will take somewhere between 30 and 90 seconds. Mm. And so the sheer volume and the work involved for someone to countermand the amount of shame that I'm collecting in my head requires a platoon of people. It's not just a single person's voice that I need to have in my head to counteract what is going on. I need the voices of many people. I need to hear them a lot. Wow. You know what I find interesting about that is I think the assumption for many people who deal with shame in a cyclical ongoing pattern is that there are people in the world who don't have to deal with shame. Like there are people who are just well-adjusted enough 
um, and put together enough and had just the right parents and all this. And they just don't seem to struggle in the same ways. But what your research is suggesting is that it's not an internal solution that liberates people from shame. It's actually the interpersonal connections that we forge. And what happens, I think, is healthier people tend to cultivate healthier relationships. Right. But we're all free to cultivate relationships that are transparent and you know regardless of how broken any of us are Mm -hmm. we can pursue that Mm -hmm. um one of the lies the enemy tells us is that when you're broken you don't you don't reach out right you'll be judged right it's it's often asked of me well does it make a difference that we have some sense and understanding uh the difference between shame and guilt and there actually is i think some helpful there there are differences that you just hinted at. One is that the research on guilt suggests, first of all, that where shame shows up 15 to 18 months of age, the thing that we call guilt doesn't really begin to emerge in the mind of a child until they're somewhere between the ages of about three to five years of age. Whereas with shame, the kind of shorthand is, I am bad. With guilt, I've done something bad. I feel guilty because there's this thing that I've done that has now breached a relationship with somebody else. What's even more fascinating is that the research shows this with little kids, this is with college students. If you have uh, an event in which you do something for which you feel guilty, you've hurt somebody's feelings, you've mistreated them or whatever, uh, and, and it's with a relationship with somebody that you love and care for, The vast majority of responses of people when they feel guilt is to turn toward the person that they've hurt or wounded and seek some kind of repair. Mm. With shame, we don't do that. Wow. The very neurophysiological phenomenon that we experience is such that when I anticipate turning toward anybody, it ramps up my sense of what it is that I will feel that feels so bad. And so naturally with shame, I turn away from anyone, but the very thing that I need is the other in order to help my neural networks be reconnected. But the very thing that I need is the very thing that I will not do on my own. Mm. And so this is where from a kind of a, you know, the anthropology of the biblical narrative, when we look at this whole notion that here we sit as human beings who if we were just stuck in our neurobiology of shame, which we all are, uh, we're not going to turn to other people for help on our own, which is why we got to have somebody come find us. And there's not another narrative on the planet in which a God who made us comes to find us. Like, I don't know any of our listeners, I myself included, like who doesn't want to have somebody come find them? Now, it's tricky because of course, I want you to find me, but the minute that you do, I'm worried that you're gonna see the stuff that I've been hiding from myself. And of course, this is what we would say evil tends to do. I'm gonna be found and then you're gonna see me and then you're gonna go. And so it's really tricky. It takes risk to allow ourselves to be loved. To be loved is to really be known. Yep. And yep. in all of our shame. And yep. that's that's too heavy a thing to think about for many of us. Right. Okay, pause for a second, Eric. This is where things might get confusing for our non-religious listeners. When he says there's not another narrative on the planet in which a God who made us comes to find us, what is he talking about here? Well, he's talking about world religions and mythologies, and every religion has, throughout human history, had a defining narrative. It's that story that summarizes the most important ideas 
to that worldview or to that religion. So, for example, for Jewish people, it's probably the exodus from Egypt. And so Yahweh rescues the down and out, and he breaks the chains of slavery. And for Muslim people, um, it's probably the message God revealed to the Prophet Muhammad in, in a cave. So Allah is great and he demands obedience, he deserves obedience and holiness from his people. Uh, the defining narrative in Christianity is a strange one. It is that God isn't just almighty and distant, but that he actually became a human being. He didn't just break the chains of our slavery, he wore them himself. He didn't reveal some secret knowledge from heaven, he became one of us, he, he came to find us. So it's a, it's a really staggering idea to think about. Yeah. And this is also where Dr. Thompson starts talking about in our interview about evil's use of shame. Is he talking about the devil here? I mean, yeah, he is. And I know it's confusing for people and it seems a little bit beyond the pale if you're a skeptic. But the devil, the enemy, Satan, whatever you want to call it, it's this idea that evil is real and that it's rooted in the spiritual realm. Just like there are spiritual forces of light and good that inspire love and freedom and joy, there are forces of darkness that induce fear and shame and isolation. You've actually been teaching about those dark forces lately at the story, and this is a clip from a recent message. And it's worth pointing out that this is just three days after you sat down with Dr. Thompson. So clearly that conversation had an impact on you. It didn't take very long for shame to become a part of the human story in the Bible. It's like two chapters in, in Genesis, right? At the end of chapter two, everything's great, and they're in the Garden of Eden, and they're just delightful, and everything's perfect, and, and it says that they were naked and what? Unashamed. It's a very weird use and placement of that word. Why that word and not some other word? Why unashamed? Well, it's because shame is about to enter the picture in a very real way. And the moment they took of that fruit and ate it, they began hiding from God. And they covered themselves up. They covered their nakedness. And they blamed each other. They turned away from each other. And listen, that is the key difference between something like guilt and something like shame. Guilt will lead you usually to turn toward the person you've wronged. Shame will always seek to turn you away from everyone who cares about you. That's what it does. Emotionally, spiritually, it turns you away from each other. And since Adam and Eve, that's all we've been doing. Racked by our shame, we turn away from God and hide from each other and go deeper into our dark isolation, and that's where the enemies got us. Jesus came to deal with that. Jesus came to deal with shame. That's why he chose to be born naked like the rest of us. That's why he chose to die naked on the quintessential symbol of human shame, the cross. He died taking on the shame of the world to tell us that there's a new way to deal with this insidious thing called shame and to send our enemy a message. So you refer back a lot to Genesis 2 and 3, and uh, do you see the Adam and Eve story as a prototype of the effects of shame on humanity? Well, I, I find it's really curious, the notion that that we were, you know, we read in, even in Genesis 1, this sense of let us make mankind in our image, this this notion that we are, we are made for community. We're made to live and make things together. Mm -hmm. And and I, I you, you just get this sense that the most beautiful, durable things that we make in the world, we do so with others in the space of great vulnerability where shame is disallowed from being part of the conversation. The whole notion of naked in, in the Genesis context isn't even primarily referring just to their physicality, it's referring to their vulnerability, to the fact that in order for them to flourish, they need the other. Mm. And it is into this vulnerability that we were intended to live and breathe and make things that shame does its work. 
where it twists just enough, where vulnerability is originally designed and intended to create the opportunity for beautiful things to be made, it twists it just so that now, not only are we not making things together, I'm doing things in isolation. Like, for, now I'm putting leaves over my private parts. Right. Like I'm doing We're not doing that together. Like, I'm doing that. And we, we very quickly see that isolation, one of shame's most visible elements, really starts to play a role that becomes self-perpetuating and snowballs. I tell people, like, I, I really do believe that evil is the second smartest force on the planet. And when it moves to manipulate shame... Shame will do, I think, what we read in the third chapter of Genesis that evil does. Evil just kind of like shrinks into the background. doesn't need notoriety. It just wants to devour us. Right. So we, I, I pay a lot of attention to the Genesis account, I think, largely because we get very uh, like viscerally powerful pictures of what it is that we do all day long to ourselves and to each other. It's not easy for me to want to be naked with others, to want to be vulnerable with others. Right. So in your work, what specifically do you see shame doing to the human brain and what behaviors or habits or tendencies come out of that, practically speaking? Neurophysiologically, one of the first things that happens is in this disintegrating state is that there are all kinds of things that quite literally begin to be disconnected. My thinking brain and my feeling brain and my sensing brain, these different neural networks that represent the different things that my mind does, all tend to suddenly be unable to work in concert together. They're being separated, isolated from each other in terms of their function. Mm. In addition, as that is happening, I am literally in my own state as a person, I'm going to do the same thing with you. I'm going to turn away from you. I'm going to disconnect from you. I'm going to do all kinds of things that literally is changing the dynamic between the two of us, myself and my wife, myself and my kids, so forth and so on. I talk in The Soul of Shame about the fact that we're storytellers. Right. And this is an important element of this. It's not just that I experience shame, but as a storyteller, I am constantly in the business of making sense of what I sense. We like to say in our work that the central nervous system operates bottom to top and right to left. My spinal cord coming to my brainstem, to my limbic circuitry, to my right hemisphere. And it sends everything to the left hemisphere, where my left hemisphere in its logical linear processing is now making sense of. It's telling a story, making sense of what everything else that's coming up from the bottom and from the right is sensing. And this is happening at light speed. Yeah. And so when I find some element of shame that starts to enter this picture, I then start to tell stories accordingly. Now, if I grew up in a house where my dad and I had experiences in which I felt shame, but there was no repair work done, I'm going to tell a story about that. And by the time I'm 18, the story might be something like, I feel bad because I haven't worked hard enough to be a good enough son. And that's the truth. That's what my neuroplastic reality has become. When the reality is, I feel bad because my father has behaved badly over many, many, many years, but now I have just continued to agree with that narrative, and I've kind of piled on to that. And so what I then do is I will work harder to be a better son, or I do all kinds of other things. You know, I, 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 I find I'm smoking weed, or I'm drinking too much, or I'm, mm. do, I'm doing all, I have all, uh, an array of coping strategies that I will use to help me reduce the distress, the shame that I feel. Right. And unfortunately, uh, those kinds of short-term coping strategies don't really do much to keep me from, once they've worn off, to keep me from going right back to the same narrative. Right. This just continues. Oh, it just in plays into the narrative. Exactly. Until you end up in my office because your brain has literally run out of track. It doesn't have any more options with which to deal with this disintegrating state of shame. So you go back to the beginning of the story and you edit 
in real time to tell the new story. We do. I mean, I, this one of the examples, this is, this is a real story of, of one of my friends, one of my patients. The standard question we ask people, can you tell me about what life was like growing up in your house? And his answer was, I grew up in a really loving Christian home. Uh, which, as we say to people, for some folks who don't know this, that's code for life really sucked. But I just, I, just, I can't really say that. Um, you just did. Right. Yeah. And so we keep asking questions. And the next question would be, oh, well, can you tell us a little bit about who is in charge of discipline in your house? And he thought. And he eventually got around to saying, well, my mom was really in charge of discipline. And the reason for that was because my father had a pretty bad temper Oh, and as it turned, I guess he was pretty brutal when it came to responding to one of my siblings who didn't get along with my dad nearly as easily. And so we paused and I asked, so how is it that the answer to the question, what was it like growing up in your house, is I grew up in a really loving Christian home? Like, that's just flat out not true. But this is the kind of thing that we do. We tell stories as a way to help us cope with these things until someone comes looking for us, until someone comes looking and asking a certain set of questions that really invite us to tell our story more truly. Now, I want to suggest that like my, my patient, uh, he's not lying. This is the story that he has told that he has had to tell because he's had nobody else to tell his story with him in a way that is true to what it is. But that means that for 40 years, he has been walking around having to somehow find a way to manage the afflicting affective state of all that brutality in his house and the distress that it causes that's locked up in neural networks of memory while he's telling a different story in order to help him keep all that on lockdown. But the reason that he's in my office telling me that story in the first place is because he was now at a point where his anxiety was so bad that he couldn't function getting to work. And we come to find out that telling the story more truly at first glance, I might like the idea in theory, but to tell it more truly means I am going to have to go back and wander into some of those hallways where I do remember feeling my father's brutality. But the difference is, this time, I'm not going to let you do that by yourself. And as you remember those stories, those will not be stories that you're telling by yourself. You're going to be telling those stories with me and eventually in a group of people. who are not gonna leave you alone with what you feel. Mm. And it is in the revealing of this shame and this sadness and this felt sense of disintegration that literally, as he bears witness to others receiving his story with compassion and mercy and acknowledging that his father was not okay, it literally transforms his memory of what it's like for him to be alone with his story because now he is no longer alone with that story. Wow. And in this way, those voices now help him co-narrate the story more truly as a story of grace, as a story of someone coming to find him saying, we will not leave you alone. And in the middle of this. Right. So I think most people see you here at the story, Julie, and probably assume that you've got it all together and you're some kind of super Christian because you work for a church and <laughs> you got it all figured out. But I know you well enough by now to know that a big part of the reason you've been successful in your career, um, sharing other people's stories is because you've also struggled a lot in your own story. Mm -hmm. um, was, was shame a part of that equation for you? 
Without a doubt. Without a doubt. And Eric, you know how much I hate talking about myself publicly. It's not because I have anything to hide. I think my work sharing other people's stories has been my best coping strategy for dealing with the shame that I've felt most of my life. You know, until a few years ago, I'll be honest, there wasn't a day that went by that I didn't tell myself how I'd failed that day again. You know, I failed to be perfect, Mm -hmm. how there's no way anyone could like me um, because there was nothing to like about me and how surely I had said something that day that would prove to whoever it was I was talking to that I was less than perfect. So uh, help me understand, like, where, where do you think that came from? Well, I'm no Dr. Thompson, so I can't say for sure. Um, But starting with my earliest childhood memories, I remember just feeling like a total outsider. Mm. You know, my dad was French, as French as they come, with a thick, thick accent and lots of mistresses. (laughs) (laughs) And my mom's from New England, which is basically like the polar opposite of France. I mean, the food's bad. At least it was when I lived there. And people don't talk about things like sex. Uh, And in my mom's family, everyone prioritized acting like we had it all together. Mm. My parents went through a pretty ugly divorce when I was eight. And that's when I started traveling back and forth between these two countries a few times a year. And it caused me to grow up very fast. You know, I'd seen a lot of things that most eight-year-olds had not seen. I'd experienced a lot of emotions I didn't know how to handle. And looking back... I think that's where the shame came from. Mm. When I was with my mom and her family, I wasn't allowed to express my sadness and anger. I couldn't talk about and work through the things that I'd witnessed, and it wasn't okay to be vulnerable. I remember one day I found a book in my mom's closet, because I was snooping through her closet, (laughs) called The Difficult Child. I think I was nine years old. Um, And apparently that was me, because I had emotions that no one knew how to deal with, and that really stuck with me. I believed I was that difficult child. Then there was my dad's family, you know, the French, where oversharing is the name of the game Mm -hmm. and not caring what anyone thinks about you. And I felt much more comfortable with that side of me and that side of my family. But that was just as unhealthy, I realize now, because no one knew how to regulate these intense emotions in a healthy way. Uh, You know, nobody goes to therapy in France to figure that out. Mm. And even though we'd all act like we just didn't care what other people thought, we really cared about what other people thought. We just had to hide that, too. Eric, you know this about me because even though you never met him, I talk about my dad all the time. You do. And my father and I loved each other so much. And he was the center of my universe. He's been gone for six years now. um, Mm. And I still want to cry thinking about it. But most of the time, we communicated by shouting at each other, (laughs) you know, and a good conversation between us often ended in tears. And somehow this all combined led to this very intense fear of abandonment in me. Wow. So Dr. Thompson talks a lot about how um, when we go through seasons like that, we, we tend to develop coping habits to get through it. Looking back, did you see yourself developing any of those coping habits? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It started in high school. I started hanging out mostly with guys who didn't expect any emotional intimacy from me the way women did in relationships. And I started using drugs to cope with my anxiety. As early as 14 years old, I started burying myself in my work, Hmm. you know, first at my high school TV studio, later working for network news shows. Because work very quickly became the only place I felt confident. I was really good at playing perfect Hmm. in that environment. Yeah. So for how many years did that work for you? Well, it never really worked, honestly. Hmm. Um, The shame just started becoming more deeply rooted in my daily life. You know, I was living in New York, working around the clock, producing news shows, And when I wasn't working, I was partying really hard with my friends. You know, we'd stay out till three or four in the morning every weekend. We'd drink a lot, smoke a lot, and I hooked up with a lot of men. These were all coping strategies for dealing with the shame that I felt inside that was really just getting worse. Mm. Because in the moments I wasn't working or partying, I was literally replaying every interaction I'd had that day in my head that I deemed important and searching for proof that I was less than perfect. You know, reasons to believe people must hate me. Like, not just, not like to be around me, but like really hate me. Mm. 
And looking back, I realize um, I was obsessively retelling stories with my own negative spin, just like Dr. Thompson talks about. And I was isolating myself by trying to act like everything was okay on the outside when I was around people and, and really just letting the shame take over in my, you know, private yeah. moments. So what happened next in your 20s? So when I was about 26, I was dating a guy for a few weeks, you know, nothing really serious. I wasn't falling in love with this guy or anything. But one night after work, we were on the phone catching up about really nothing in particular. I have no idea what we were talking about. Do people even still talk on the phone when they're dating? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't like to get phone calls anymore. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, in the middle of the conversation, we were disconnected. And I tried calling him back. I remember I was standing in my tiny New York City kitchen. And it went to voicemail. And he never called back. And this was like pre-texting days. You mean like never, ever? Never, ever called back. and oh never talked gosh. to him again. We were, I think I was like mid-sentence. <laughs> and so in my mind, that was like the proof I'd been searching for. That I was absolutely a terrible person. Mm. Completely unworthy of anyone's love. For someone to despise me so much that they wouldn't even call me back to finish the conversation. And a few weeks later... I was in therapy for the first time in my life. Mm. I didn't think about it back then, but what Keith, my therapist, did was to help me retell all the stories from my past that had caused me so much shame. And it took another several years to recover from that shame. You know, I realize how God pulled me out of it now uh, by putting a man in my life who saw through the shame and is fiercely loyal um, with kids who love me in a way that's unlike any love I'd felt before. And by bringing me to Houston and allowing me to know him, God, in a way that I never knew him before and realizing that he was there all along loving me through my shame when, when I thought I was completely alone and unworthy of love. Mm. So as you're coming to these realizations, how exactly did you go from being so wrapped up in shame and self-loathing that you would sort of self-isolate to being someone who's so willing to be vulnerable, even with thousands of podcast listeners. I remember you saying once when I first started coming to the story and I was still really deeply skeptical that we need Christian community. And that really rubbed me the wrong way, Eric, because I love my non-Christian friends and I just didn't get it. But I, I think I get it now. No, I, I know I get it because true Christian friends like the ones I have now, can love you in a way that allows you to be totally vulnerable. You know, on my worst days, I know that I can tell you and Gio and my other Christian inner circle here at The Story that I'm struggling, and you're all going to love me no less for it at the end of the day. Mm. Wow, it is a beautiful thing when Christians get it, when it really clicks with us what the single most important idea in the gospel is, and that's grace. If one word could define the whole Christian narrative, it's grace. Grace is not like the little prayer you say before dinner, and grace is not weakness. Grace is unmerited, undeserved, unconditional love that accepts you and welcomes you home and longs for you, regardless of what kind of day you had or how you performed at work or what your deliverables are. Grace is pure love. And that is what Jesus came to show us, we believe as Christians. And sometimes Christians fail to really internalize and grasp this concept, but when it happens, it's beautiful to see the transformation in people like, like you've seen in yourself. Yeah, and I think the most powerful thing is, at least in my own story, is once I was able to feel that grace for myself in my own life, I can extend that grace so much easier to everyone around me, too.
I wonder, like my earliest memories of the word shame were all indicative of the idea that we should embrace it, hmm. that we should feel it. Hmm. You ought, you ought to be ashamed, hmm. 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 or have you no shame? Hmm. Hmm. Is that true? Should we be ashamed sometimes? I find Paul's language in the seventh chapter of Second Corinthians to be really helpful here where he writes that there is a godly grief that leads to repentance, and there is an ungodly grief that leads to death. And I read that, and I think, to me, those words apply to this question. In Genesis chapter 3, the problem was not that shame existed. The problem is what we do in response to it. If it's happening in a context in which it's easy for me to become isolated and I don't have a community of people with whom I'm regularly revealing myself and to whom they are revealing themselves to me, I will practice uh, the inclination that shame tends to lead me toward, which is isolation. And then everything just snowballs from there. If I am in a context in which I'm practicing revealing shame, one of the other things that I, that I do is that I also develop the capacity to feel shame and associate it properly when I've done something for which shame is a, is a proper response. I think there are plenty of things, actions that we take for which we don't have any shame. But I would suggest that even those actions that we take that we don't have any shame about are the result of lots and lots and lots of practice, coping with shame that we can't tolerate. And once you develop enough callus over your heart, you don't feel anything. Mm. When, I mean, we've had plenty of people that come into our office who have committed acts, the nature of which they're not really all that ashamed of until we start to ask them questions about their life story. Mm. Questions that have to do with parts of their story that are far more ancient than their current behavior that is shameful, but they don't feel any shame for. And when you start to have them reveal what life with their father or their mother or life with growing up in their systemic abuse was all about, you find lights starting to go on that connect them to current behaviors. And you see that we work really hard to stay away from our shame because primarily we don't know anything better to do because we're so disconnected from each other. And that's a really painful place to be. And when our shame bucket is full, whatever we throw into it just bounces off. Of course. Right. 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 Fascinating. Yeah. I want to get into something that's a little more personal to me because you, in your book, you go right at pastors Hmm. and our problem with shame. Hmm. And I wonder why it is that uh, you pick out this segment of your (laughs) listeners Mm -hmm. to pick on or talk Mm -hmm. about when it comes to this topic in particular. Uh, I I see a number of pastors, and I think they dwell in one of the most poorly defended professions on the planet. What do you mean by that? I don't think anybody has a harder job, and I don't think that they're protected well enough. Huh. There are many situations in the lives of the pastors that I know where it's not easy for them to find a community where they're going to be understood. I find that uh, pastors are just really in vulnerable places in some ways like nobody else is. Fascinating. So I'm, I, I, I grieve for them. I feel very protective for them. I. Hmm. That actually means a lot to me personally. I do think that there's something unique about this profession. I mean, you have people asking how you're doing all the time, and some of them are sincere and would receive whatever you tell them. Mm. I have people like that in my life, but it's not about them, it's about me. In that moment, not trusting anyone with my crap. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's not just fear of being judged, it's fear of being discredited and potentially fired. Right. Again, that whole thing about being left, however that works itself out, being fired, being kicked to the curb, whatever this... Forgotten. I have friends that have just been kicked to the curb and forgotten forever by the churches that used to champion them and love them because 
of yeah. some one indiscretion that happened or, or yeah. some favorite sin they committed. Yeah, right. Hey guys, it's Brother Romero. I just want to make this video for our church family and for the people that listen online. And I just want to just tell you I'm sorry for, for what I've done. I went to Jacksonville and I went to a casino and I was drinking. And there were girls there that were prostitutes. And uh, I committed adultery on my wife multiple times. I drank and gambled multiple times. And, you know, last Wednesday I resigned and I didn't tell anybody. Most of you in this church only experience what I do on Sundays. But the reality is as a leader and a pastor of a church, uh, what happens in between those Sundays is just as important. Uh, and it requires a lot of leadership and it requires a lot of leadership energy. And leaders in any realm of life, leaders who lead on empty don't lead well. And for some time now, I've been leading on empty. And so I believe that the best thing for me to do is to step aside from Crosspoint. And so I am officially resigning uh, as the pastor of Crosspoint Church. There was a time for about 12 years when I was a pastor and preaching and leading churches, but I really wasn't a believer. And uh, at times I was outspoken about that. But most of the time I just covered it up and sort of spouted the company line as much as I needed to and um, pursued social justice. And so that created a disconnect in me, you know, I think that created some kind of fragmentation that led to some deeper shame. And I felt this inadequacy in that way that was deep, deep inside of me. And then what ended up happening, and I'm not blaming anyone but myself for this, but I, I got into some pretty unhealthy coping habits. And, no, welcome to the club. Yeah, yeah. But I treated the coping habits like it was the thing. Mm -hmm. right. It wasn't the thing. Yeah. All this other stuff was the thing. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the big thing was like porn and stuff, you know, which was obviously something that drove me deeper into the shadows of isolation for years and years and years. Uh, and it was literally for me, hell on earth. Hmm. And it did stifle creativity and capacity for relationships and leadership. Um, but it was a secret only I knew. Hmm. And that's a, that's a terrible place hmm. to be for many, many years. Yeah. And when we came here, I knew that from the very beginning, I was going to have to tear down those old monuments mm -hmm. to darkness in my heart. And mm -hmm. so that no one else would like find out about them mm -hmm. later, you know, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be found mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. I knew I, I had to take a proactive role and disempower the darkness in that way mm -hmm. and, and uh, share. And mm -hmm. boy, did I share. I know you're not surprised to hear a pastor come out against pornography. I mean, big shocker there that a pastor is standing on his pedestal, his soapbox, looking down at all you heathens with your perversions. And listen, this is not me on a soapbox judging you for your porn problems. This is me, a former porn user, empathizing with you. What was fascinating uh, is how people started coming out of the woodwork immediately mm -hmm. as if mm -hmm. I had said something that they had been thirsting for mm -hmm. by just telling my story yeah most people said i've never heard porn talked about in church before <laughs> <laughs> mm. but everybody else was everybody said i've my my husband or me or whatever like yeah what do i do now yeah what do i do now yeah and they like i did they were thinking that the porn was the thing mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. porn was just a echo mm of the thing. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think for me that was a good first step, but I confess that I still deal with shame. Mm -hmm. The shame now comes from the disconnect between how I think m most people see me mm -hmm. and how I see myself mm -hmm. and who I think I really am. Mm -hmm. Mm. And that gets worse, mm. the, six, the more successful you mm. are. Indeed. In ministry. Right. That's predictable. Yeah. Yeah. And the more people I have sitting in those chairs out there, uh -huh. the lonelier yep. it gets. Yep. It's tricky when there are more people 
who are hearing you do your work because your work is good, the more intentional and intensive would be the need for you to have your Wesleyan group of people that you are meeting with every week by whom you are being known and who are knowing you right. and who will not leave you alone and that you don't leave alone, the group of people who are protecting you, the group of people who see it as their mission to take care of you come hell or high water, yeah. regardless of how many are or aren't in the auditorium. Right. I really don't think pastors are the only ones who experience this sort of performative-based shame. Right, right. Um, I do think it's exacerbated sometimes in uh, our little world, but most of the shame I experience now is the emails I never sent, the Bible study I sort of punted and didn't do a good job with, the call I didn't make to that widow to mm -hmm. check in. I, I carry that stuff around mm -hmm. in ways that I think few people understand. Mm -hmm. What's striking about having a regular place for us to unload that, for us to name these things, and for the others who are hearing this story say, Eric, like, you're working so hard. And I just want you to know, like, I just so, I'm so proud of how hard you're working. I'm not proud of the benchmarks. I'm not proud of the things you're getting done. I'm proud of how hard you're working. Mm. And I really hear that that, Bible study got punted and so forth. And like, I get it. We're totally good. Yeah. And I would want you to hear and see me say to you, we're good, you're good, while we're talking about the punted Bible study. Mm. Because from a brain standpoint, it is in that moment that your memory of the punted Bible study literally is neurally altered because it's now got my voice and face painted on it. Now, if this becomes a regularly held practice that I do, pretty soon I come to a point where my brain is actually no longer holding these things by itself. It's literally being held, and if you take quantum mechanics seriously enough here, it's literally being held with me by other people. This is not just metaphor. This is physics in which I am not by myself with this. Mm. And if that's the case, then I literally have that energy now available for me to do the things that I really want to do. Right. I'm 56. And for 25, six years, I've got two guys that I meet with on Tuesday morning mm. for prayer and confession. And there's nothing about me that they don't know. Wow. And a spiritual director that I meet with once a month, and there's nothing about me that he doesn't know. And I probably have another half dozen guys for whom this is true. And if I don't have these guys, I'm a dead man. And uh, these, are the, these are the people who protect me. Right. And I think, I mean, I, your, your words earlier gripped me, the idea that at the end of the day, I just need someone to come find me. Mm -hmm. And we all do. Mm -hmm. And that's what your guys represent is, yeah. is Jesus coming to find you every yep. Tuesday morning or whenever y'all yep. meet. Yep. And I think that's all of our only hope. Right. So in getting people to reimagine or retell their stories, what role does Jesus coming to find us in this gospel narrative play in, uh, in that process? You know, there's a story in uh, the ninth chapter of John's gospel of Jesus healing a blind man, a blind guy who wasn't even asking for healing. And he's healed, and then all kinds of bad things happen to him immediately, which, of course, is kind of ironic. And if I'm the mm -hmm. blind dude, I'm like, what the heck? Right. And at the end of this story, we read that when Jesus heard that they had put him out, he came to find him. And I read the gospel. And I read it as a story in which this is what Jesus is always doing. He's coming to find us. He's coming to find us in other people. He's coming to find us in ways that surprise us. And I think this is what Good Friday really represents in such a powerful way. 
it's often said that, you know, we have Jesus have these seven sayings, these seven I am's, right? Yeah. I'm the bread of life. I'm the, the way and the truth in life, these seven different things. And it's rightly been pointed out that these are not just tidings of comfort and joy for us Christians, which they are, but they're also the very things that got him killed. And for Jesus, we might say, well, he's just making declarative statements about the truth. But I also think that they're acts of great vulnerability for him, mm. that he knows that in telling his story truly, People are coming for him too. And so I think he knows what it's like. He knows how hard it is to be vulnerable. He knows how frightening it can be. And, uh, you know, if you were to Google images for crucifixion, you'd get about 200 pictures on your screen. And only two of them would be probably completely accurate. You know, what we know about what the Romans did is the Romans didn't just crucify people to kill them. They crucified them to humiliate the victim as well as the community. And so Jesus wouldn't have anything on. He would be stripped naked. And we have a hard enough time allowing God to come as far as he came. But the Gospels tell us that that, in fact, is what he did. That he came to be with us and to demonstrate that he knows, A, what shame is like. B, he's not afraid of it. See, he's definitely not afraid to be in ours with us and that it is in the being with us as seen through the lens of Easter that we get a picture of a God who doesn't just see and is willing to be with our shame but is taking us someplace where that shame will be healed and we will be recommissioned to start to pay far more attention to his delight in us and his joy with us and his desire for us to co-create the next new thing he wants us to make with him, then he is wanting us to pay attention to our shame. Mm. And to me, that's just really, really good news. Amen. Kurt Thompson, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. A lot of us have bought into the lie that we're supposed to be self-sufficient, never reliant never vulnerable, never transparent, never weak, always standing on our own two feet, especially men. Listen to me, guys. You've been told this lie. Many of us have bought this lie, and we're worse off for it. And we have no real set of friends that are good for us, that not only pick up the phone when we call, but they know what we're really saying. They can read between the lines. We can be honest with them. We can tell them everything, and they can be our cloud, right? But the Bible presents this idea of a cloud of witnesses as a protective force field that is vital to your overcoming in this spiritual struggle because... No matter how faithful you get, no matter how Christian you are, there will be times, days, or months, seasons where you feel surrounded by the enemy. And if you don't have a cloud of witnesses that's closer to you than the enemies are, you will be susceptible to attack, defenseless. Because what a great cloud of witnesses does when it surrounds you closer than those forces do is it drowns out the voices of the darkness in your life. They'll be the voices telling you who you really are, a child of the living God, redeemed by the blood of Jesus, worth the love of God. If you're not a Christian yet, I. I would just say uh, that line, fixing your eyes on Jesus, means no longer being a scattered person, but just fixing your eyes and making him the center. There's no better place to fix your eyes. There's no better person to chase after than him. Make him the center of your life today. He will equip you for whatever battle you're facing, whether it's addiction, whether it's depression, whether it's self-image or shame. You need not fight it alone. In fact, in Christ, when he took on that burden of shame, he won the war you're fighting. You can walk in victory with him.
This episode of Maybe God was produced by Julie Marie Coltois and Eric Huffman. Nathan Bonus and Aubrey Snyder are the sound engineers, and our editors are Shannon Steffen, Brittany Holland, and Justin Mayer. As always, a special thanks to our co-creator, Brandon Duke. For more information or to tell us what you think, head to our website, maybegodpod.com. <laughs>